Right, good morning everybody and welcome to the Imperial War Museum, Duxford. This museum is part of five museums that make up the Imperial War Museums and the aim of the museums is to collect stories um, and objects of people's experiences of war and preserve them for future generations. Every object in the museums has a story to tell and today we're focusing on a very big object, the Lancaster bomber behind us there. Now this particular aircraft um, is a Canadian um, built Lancaster. There was over 7,000 Lancasters built in World War II and just under 500 were built in Canada. And this is one of the last 250 or so. And as we see when we go around to the side of the aircraft in about 10 minutes, we'll see there is a slight difference between the Canadian Lancasters at the end of the war and the British. But in general, they are pretty much identical. Now this Lancaster was built in December 1944 in Canada. Um, it came to Britain in January 1945. It was given to a Canadian squadron flying at Middleton St George near Darlington. They damaged it in a trading accident. Uh, it was repaired, but it never actually flew any combat missions in World War II. At the end of the war, the Canadians took it back home with them and they changed it to be used for um, air sea rescue, act to sea and maritime patrols. Uh, they eventually sold it in 1965 and the Imperial War Museum acquired it in 1986. As you look at it now, it's been restored back to the colours and the markings inside and out of the Canadian squadron who were flying it in April 1945. You'll notice that it's painted black. Uh, any youngsters here got an idea why it might have been painted black? Yes, it's for flying at night, that's right, it's camouflage. So this aircraft was um, designed in 1942. The Lancaster was built in the middle of the war to take into account the fact that you were now going to have to fly really high at night because it was too dangerous to fly them during the day and you wanted to carry as many bombs as possible. And this was the best aircraft that the RF designed in World War II to do that job. And by the end of the war in 1945, you have pretty much over a thousand bombers every night going to Germany and occupied Europe dropping their bombs and the Lancasters make up most of them by the end of the war. The Halifaxes and the Stirlings and other aircraft that had flown before um, were being swapped for these aircraft because they were the best ones we had. So this aircraft is a heavy bomber. It's called a heavy bomber not just because it's really big it's because of the amount of bombs and the size of the bombs it can carry. If you look at the three trolleys underneath the, the, uh, the bomb here, you've got 3.8 tonnes of bombs there. So that's the same weight as three medium-sized cars today. Uh, this aircraft could carry all of those in one go, and it could actually carry more. The biggest bomb it could carry was called the Grand Slam Bomb, and that was £22,000, 26.6 feet long the same weight as two fully grown elephants. Um, and that was a special bomb for going through thick concrete defences. Invented by Barnes Wallace, the same man who invented the Banksy bomb, we've got an example of over there near the Lancaster. So these aircraft, over a thousand a night, are going to Germany with a crew of seven. And their aim is to drop so many bombs on Germany and other targets in occupied Europe that the Germans will give in and surrender before we have to send soldiers on the ground. Now, those of you who know the war pretty well will know that didn't actually happen, but the Germans had to take a million men and hundreds of guns to man their anti-aircraft guns and searchlights. So those men could have been fighting against the Russians and the British, the Americans and the Allies after D-Day, but they weren't because they would affect, they were protecting their city. So. The men who flew these definitely did their bit to make the war finish quicker than it could have done. And this was a very dangerous job. These were brilliant aircraft, very strong, but the conditions they were flying in were very dangerous. During the war, 55,000 men were killed flying these aircraft in World War II. And that was actually 65% of all the men who flew them in combat. So you had the same chance of surviving your 30 missions, bombing the enemy, same chance of surviving as a, an officer in the trenches in World War I. So this was one of the most dangerous jobs you could do in World War II, 1939 to 1945. 
Now what we're going to do now is find out a little bit about the seven men who flew this aircraft. Their average age was 21. The youngest we know flew who lied about their age was 16. And those younger men were usually quite small and they were ideal for going in the two small turrets um, at the back and at the top of the aircraft. But the man who is the most important person in the aircraft is going to be sitting up in that perspex cat cockpit up there. He's the pilot. He's sitting on the left. Now he's about 21, could be a bit younger, could be a bit older. He's like the captain of a ship. What he decides is going to happen on the plane happens. He might only be a sergeant with three stripes and there may be other people in the plane who are an officer who are more important than him. They may be a lot older than him. But it doesn't matter. He's the pilot. What he decides is what everybody does. And most of the people who flew these aircraft um, loved their pilots. And most of the men who survived the war um, said they survived because their pilot was the best pilot in the RAF. So these young men had to stay calm the entire time, no matter how much danger was happening, in order to make sure the crew got back. Because his responsibility is to get the plane off the ground safely, to get to the target correctly, to drop the bombs in the right place and get the plane back. If the plane is damaged and is going to crash, he will stay at the controls until everybody else in the plane has had a chance to escape. Only then will he try and make his escape from the aircraft. Sometimes the aircraft was so badly damaged when they were flying them back that the pilots would have to be physically carried out of their seats out of the aircraft because they didn't have the energy to, uh, to do any more than that. So the pilot has got a massive amount of responsibility. Now by this stage in the war, you haven't got a co-pilot or a second pilot. To get a thousand bombers in the air every night, you can't have two pilots in every plane. So who else is in the cockpit? There's one other man and he's called the flight engineer. He sat behind the pilot in the cockpit, slightly to his right, and he's looking at his own set of dials, moving fuel about between the fuel tanks and the wings. He helps the pilot take off and land. He's probably done some of his training in the, uh, the factories that make the Lancasters, so he can hopefully fix and maybe repair some of the minor things that might go wrong in the aircraft. Now I'm dressed for flying this aircraft very, very low, like they did in the, in the Dam Buster mission. But you've got to remember that these men were flying at night at about 18,000 feet at temperatures down to minus 30 degrees. So they would have five or six thick layers of clothing, a May West, in case you landed in the sea, and a parachute harness over the top. So you're very big and bulky, you can't move around very much. The pilots have the lowest level of clothing because there is a bit of heating in the cockpit that comes from the engines. Engines, But everybody else in the aircraft is freezing cold pretty much all the time. So who else is there? In the nose up here, we have the bomb aimer, or the bombardier as the Americans call them. And he sits and mans the two machine guns for most of the flight. And he's firing these little bullets here, the 303 which is the same bullet as the rifles the British Army were doing. Um, they don't go very far, they're not very powerful, they make small holes, but you could fire over a thousand in a minute. But you've got to be careful because you've only got one thousand for each gun up there. Um, so you're using very, very short bursts of a second or two seconds of ammunition. Now when you get near the target where you're going to drop your bombs, he's going to drop down and lie across the floor of the Lancaster uh, with only a thin bit of metal between him and the gunfire from the ground. He's looking down through a special sight. There's a little cross. When he gets that over the target, he'll drop his button, press the button, and shout bombs away or bombs gone. The aircraft still has to fly straight for a minute though. Because that little ground uh, section of perspex there has a camera above it. So you actually take pictures at night of where your bombs have dropped. In order to do that, you drop a flash bomb along with your normal bombs, and that works like the flash on a camera. So when the flash goes off, it records where your bombs have Good dropped. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the staff announcement. Please could Phil Sawford or Holly Webster contact the control room. That's Phil Sawford or Holly Webster to contact the control room. Now we then move to the next two men who are up towards the front of the aircraft and they're sitting in these two positions that have been recreated here. On the left you've got the wireless operator or radio operator as we call him and on the right 
you've got the navigator, the man who tells you where you are. Now they're sitting behind the cockpit, down inside the aircraft, with a special screen between them and the cockpit, because they're the only people who've got any little small lamps, so they can see what they're doing. Um, so they're in the bowels of the aircraft, they can't see out, they're very isolated. Now we'll start with the wireless operator. He sat there with headphones on, with a radio. He's got this thing out for words and people speaking. He's listening out for what this little thing here does. He's listening out for Morse code messages, dots and dashes. And if any children want to have a go, we've got the Morse code station over there. You can have a practice, see how it works. So you have to listen very carefully because there's a lot of noise from the engines. Uh, the radio has to keep being tuned in. You're listening out for messages that tell you what the wind speed and direction is so that the navigator can work out correctly where you are. And more importantly, you're listening out for the, uh, the order that the mission has been called off because the weather ahead is too bad. If you have fallen asleep or you're not listening properly, you might miss that and be the only aircraft going to Berlin and back that night. And when you get back, if you get back, you're not going to be very popular with the rest of your seven-man crew. So the radio operator has a very important job. The navigator is sat at his station in the near darkness with uh, maps, with compasses, pencils, rulers, simple calculating machines. And his job is to make sure you're going in the right direction there and back. Obviously, if he doesn't get his sums right, you might not end up over the target you're um, meant to bomb, and you might fly over somewhere that's uh, really dangerous that you were supposed to avoid. More importantly, on the way back, if he doesn't do his sums right there, you might think you're over Britain, and you suddenly find yourself over the sea with no idea of where you are, which obviously would then be really, really dangerous when you haven't got much fuel left. Um, to help him, he can go into a little Perspex dome behind the cockpit, you can't quite see from here, um, but it's called the Astro Dome, so the Star Dome. So he can go up there, if he can see the sky, if there's not too much cloud, he can check the stars to find out where he is. But navigation throughout the war is probably the hardest job on the plane, because it's very, very difficult. Now what we do now is to move around to see two of the more dangerous positions, the last two men in the crew. So if you'd like to follow him this way around to the side of the aircraft. front and behind as well. Gathering. Right, we're now moving round to the middle of the aircraft and we're looking at the gun turret above the top of the, uh, the aircraft's fuselage. Now these are the two air gunners. They trained to fire the guns and protect the aircraft from attack by other German, small German aircraft that are trying to shoot you down in the darkness, trying to creep up on you. So your job is to maybe be sat there for six, seven, eight, nine hours in the darkness looking out for another black aircraft that's very small that's coming to get you. So it's a difficult job, um, very tiring. This is a uh, Canadian Lancaster from near the end of the war because what you'll see is an American turret, the one that's on the ground there, in there. Uh, and that's a 50 caliber machine gun turret, so it's firing those instead of these little ones. So this Canadian Lancaster is slightly better defended than the general RAF Lancaster. Now look at the size of that turret, you've got to climb up into it in all of your big bulky flying clothes, parachute harnesses. There's no room for your parachute in the aircraft to wear while you're working for most of the people on the plane. So this is your parachute, a chest harness parachute. It's hanging on the side of the aircraft wall or in your desk station. When the aircraft's crashing, you've got to find it in the dark, um, clip it onto the two big clips on your harness, then escape to one of the hatches, one of the clubs, the side door or the turret at the back, pull the ripcord and the parachute comes out in front of you. You could train to do it in under a minute, but that wasn't when your aircraft was spinning in darkness towards the ground 
um, covered in flames. Um, so a very, very dangerous thing to have to do. Now we're going to move around to the back now to see the most dangerous um, place on the aircraft. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> hang it down like that. So your feet are going to be below you. So hopefully your feet should hit the ground first and then you should be on your back. Depending on which way the wind is blowing. Okay. <laughs> okay, right, we're at the tail and uh, the most dangerous spot on the aircraft. Uh, you're furthest away from everybody else and this is the coldest part of the plane. Most of the air gunners took two of the Perspex panels out um, so they could see better and obviously that made it much colder. There's no bulletproof glass or anything. This is just Perspex. Um, so it will break very easily. To get into here, if you look to the left when you go in, you have to slide over the toilet, um, down a little passageway, you slide into your very, very cramped cockpit. Most gunners can't fit one of these in there with them, even though they are the smallest men on the crew. You then have to shut an armoured door behind you to protect your back when you spin to left and right, and your parachute is the other side of the armoured door. If the aircraft is shot down, you've got to hope your gun turret is still working because to get out you've got to make it straight again like this so you can undo the armour door, grab your parachute, clip it on and turn the gun to the side so you can fall out. If you can't do that then you are going to go down with the aircraft and unfortunately that happened all too often in the Lancaster. That's why these men called themselves tail end Charlies and a Charlie was another word for a fool or an idiot and um, so they knew that this was a bad position. In general the top turret gunner and the rear turret gunner would swap between missions rather than just doing this all the time so they could have a bit of a break from the strain of doing it. Uh, you've got most ammunition here because you know you're most likely to be attacked. You've got four guns firing the small 303 ammunition and you've got 2,500 for each gun so you know you're most likely to be attacked. The Germans knew that these aircraft had no guns underneath so their general tactic was to fly up at an angle from below and the back they would start shooting at the tail first, fire right the way up the aircraft and set the wing on fire, which is where the fuel tanks were. Most of these aircraft would have been hit like that without knowing what had hit them and they could well explode within seconds or a few minutes. Um, very, very um, difficult and dangerous work. The crew member in the tail can't really do much about that. Now we're going to finish off with one little story of some real um, Canadian aircrew who were fighting in these aircraft same as this in World War II. We're talking about a man called Andrew Minarski, who was the top turret gunner, and a man called Pat Broffy, who was sitting in the tail. These men were on their 13th mission in Lancaster's like this, um, a short mission at night to France and back. On the way back, they were hit by an enemy night fighter, and the aircraft was set on fire, and it was definitely going to crash. Andrew Minarski dropped down from his turret, attached his parachute, battled his way through the flames to the side door where he should bail out but he looked across and saw that his friend Pat was trapped in his turret at the back here. Rather than escape himself he grabbed the fire axe near the door, battled through the flames and tried to smash his way through the armoured door. Unfortunately he couldn't do it. His friend Pat in the tail told him to go back and escape out of the door. So he did. He turned round, battled through the flames, back to the door, turned, saluted his friend and then jumped from the aircraft. Unfortunately, his, air, his parachute had been damaged by the flames and he fell to his death. He was the only man who died that night from the aircraft. His friend in the tail had a miraculous escape. He fell with the aircraft 18,000 feet into the ground. The aircraft exploded and the whole tail was blown off through trees. And even though he was badly injured, he survived to tell the story. And he said the only reason why he was spared was so that he could um, tell the story of a gallant man who died sacrificing himself for a friend. 
So that story tells you something of the bond that existed between these men. They were closer than brothers. They'd chosen each other to fly with, they'd lived together, they'd fought together, and they would die to save each other. And for that brave act, he was awarded the Victoria Cross. But every man on these aircraft was brave. They had to take these risks 30 times before they had uh, a six month break. So just getting into these aircraft every night meant they all really deserved a medal. And the, man, the men who survived through today say that we weren't heroes. The real heroes were the 65% of us who didn't come back alive doing this job. So thank you very much for listening to this talk. Um, I hope you found some things there you can look for when you go in the aircraft. Imagine being in this aircraft at night in the dark at minus 30 degrees. That's what you've got to think about when you're inside. Look out for the parachutes, look out for the fire axe, think about how you're going to get in and out in an emergency. Thank you for listening. You can make your way back round through the queue to go inside the aircraft. Um, I will be at the side um, to answer any more questions that anybody's got. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well done. Cheers. Thank Brilliant. you. When you go onto this aircraft now, Remember, it is very old, it's a bit like your grandparents' children. So when you get onto it, don't pull bits too hard or they might fall off. Uh, we want it all still there tomorrow for the next set of visitors. So the key word is looking but not touching. So thank you very much for listening to this talk. Uh, if you have any other questions as you go past, feel free to ask them. Uh, and I hope you enjoy your time on the Lancaster. Thank you very much. Okay, go. Yeah, yeah, good. Hello. Hello. We finally made it. We did. Good. <laughs> Eventually. Yeah. So, please carry on. I'll try and keep out of your way. No, it's fine. Uh, we, we want to encourage that so people film as I'm talking so you're not wasting, you know. I've got to start the, the clock. It's all right. I haven't really started. So, before I talk about the aircraft, I want you to imagine what it was like in this aircraft. You're flying at 15 or 18,000 feet. Um, you're flying over enemy territory. So there's no light in here. It's not lit up like this at all. So it's black as the Ace of Spades. It's very cold in here. 15 or 18,000 feet, the skin temperature is probably about minus 25. So if you took your gloves off, your hands, the skin from your hands would actually stick to the skin of the aircraft. It was that cold. So these guys, both turrets, would actually be wearing heated suits. It's the only way they could survive. Very noisy in here, so the only way they could communicate was through the headsets. You know, you could, you could be standing that far apart from somebody, you wouldn't understand what they were saying unless you you were mic'd up. Mm. Of course they were, they were wearing oxygen masks as well. So it wasn't a very good environment to be working in. Not very easy. If you look right up the front there, you can see four red buttons. And that's about where the flight engineer is. Um, those buttons are actually the fire extinguisher buttons for the engines. And they're optional. So the system is automatic, but if, if uh, there was the, a case where the plane was coming down, then he could actually initiate fire extinguisher just before they hit the deck. So the flight engineer was there, the pilot was to his left and slightly elevated, and then ahead of them was the uh, bomb aimer and the front gunner. Then coming back you've got the um, navigator, the wireless operator, then there's a crew rest, it's a very short bed that uh, if somebody was injured they could put them in yeah. there. And then coming back this way, you see the main spar. Yeah. The big bump there and the small bump here mm. is what made this aircraft as successful as it was because they enabled the aircraft to carry all this weight. You know, you hear the stories as they told you earlier about carrying up to 22,000 pounds of weight. You know, yeah. the all up weight of this aircraft when it took off was 65,000 pounds, which at, at the time that this was designed was incredible to have mm. something that could lift that. Yeah. It was only possible because of the main spar and the, the, the extent of that design. So coming back this way you've got the mid upper turret and the ammunition box for that and the tail gun turret ammunition box was here. Uh, 
So he had to take his parachute off to, to actually sit in and operate the turret. He couldn't sit with that thing on. So they had to ha hang it here. And the other guy had to hang his... Oops, sorry. Sorry. You okay? yeah. Had to hang his uh, turret the thing down there. And this is the main bomb bay. So you've got the main bomb bay and you're able to actually look through there to see if you've got any hang-ups in the main bomb bay. The only remedy for the hang-ups was to waggle the aircraft around and hopefully that would dislodge anything that was loose. They didn't want to be coming back to a, a landing with with hung up bombs there. It was, it was always a risk of that happening. Mm. So uh, coming forward then you've got the flying controls for the aircraft. So you've got the uh, rudder and elevator flying controls. So this was not fly by wire, this was fly by cable and rods and pulleys. Uh, very mechanical uh, flight operation. And then going back there you see the LSAN toilet for everybody to use. And then further back, you've got the tail gunner's position. And his job was very important. I mean, he was looking out for enemy aircraft coming from behind. They used to come from behind and under there. And so to do that, what he had to do was take the central panel of that uh, Perspex out. So he had a clear view outside. He didn't want any uh, back reflections to get in the way of seeing air from enemy aircraft because they were you know they were tiny specks in the distance and he's got to pick them up and warn the pilot. So that's a very quick run through the aircraft. I'm sorry it's only you know it's only four minutes we get so it right. just give you some view of it. We'd like to spend longer but I think you, you get some idea this is no easy jet. You know, it's not no. padding, you know it's it's a very Although good someone used the term reverse TARDIS which I think is a very good <laughs> description of it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It is. Yeah, it's, it's a bare bones thing, so it's just designed as, as a weapon carrier and that's it. That's with it. No, no extras involved. Not built for comfort. No. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Glad you, I, I'm glad you had time to oh. you know, see the whole thing. Yeah, oh, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Will do, thank you.